So let us now discuss the expectation value of observables. What are observables? So remember the Born interpretation. which was due to Max Born. It gives us a way of computing some function f of x, say of the position of our particle x, according to the formula that the average of f of x would be given by there would be an integral and we would have the function f of x and then there would be the probability density of f of x uh, of x and then we would have d of x and if the probability was not normalized we would have to divide it by a normalization constant but according to born interpretation p of x is given by psi star x psi. So therefore, we can write this now as, let me be explicit about the limits of the integral. It's going to be something like star x. Uh, there is the f of x, the function that we're trying to take the average of, psi of x, d of x, divided by the normalization of the probability. So <clears throat> an example of such an expectation value would be the position of the particle. So if you want to have an average expectation, if you make, say, 50 different measurements of the position of the particle, there will be some average value that we'll get in that experiment. So suppose that we make 50 different copies of our um, system. So we have like 50 different copies of our system. So these are called ensembles. And they're all identically prepared. And we measure x value for each of these know ensembles and then we take the average of this so our theory should be able to predict what this average is so the average of x is going to be given by minus infinity to plus infinity here f of x is just x and then we have psi of x well let's not forget the t dependence d of x divided by so this is the expectation value of the particle so x is an example of an observable something that we can observe in an experiment. Now, what about momentum? You know, how can we observe momentum or how is the average of a momentum given? How is the expectation value of momentum give, be given? So let's discuss, let's imagine we have some particle, quantum particle, so we imagine that it's described by a wave function, which is a wave packet. So it has some sort of localization given by where the wave packet is non-zero. So from that point of view, it's natural to expect that at least the average value of the momentum would be given by the same formula as the classical mechanical formula. So remember in classical mechanics, the momentum of a particle is given by the mass times its velocity. 
So in quantum mechanics, we would expect that the expectation value of the momentum would be given by something like d dt of x. So using this proposal, we are now going to figure out how to calculate this thing. So we already figured out how this is. So just uh, for the sake of argument, we are going to assume that our wave function is normalized. So this is equals to one. We can, of course, always do that. We can, if our wave function is not normalized, then we can divide it by this, the square root of this number, right? So let's normalize our wave function. Then uh, this is going to be d by dt. And this, and this thing is just um, integral over dx times x psi star psi. So now we can differentiate under the integral sign. So of course, x doesn't depend on t. So we are going to have inside. We're going to have two terms because of the Leibniz rule. Right, so so what is this? This we can see is going to be a, a complex number plus its complex conjugate. So that means that we can write this as uh, m times dx times x two times the real part of this complex number, the real part of psi star del psi by del t, okay? So we can, uh, of course, you know, factor out the two and write it over here. Now what we can do is that we can use the free Schrodinger equation and rewrite p. So what we can do is that we can replace this time derivative uh, using the Schrodinger equation and what we get is 2m d of x times x real psi star. And then I have i h bar by 2m del squared psi del x squared, right? So I've used the real, the free Schrodinger equation. And, um, then what we can do is that we can just do an integration by parts. So we can take one of these derivatives here and take it out of the whole thing and then do an integration by parts. So if I do that, then I end up with... So what happens now is that because there's a 2m here and there's a 2m here, we can cancel them out. And once we have canceled those out, we can do an integration by parts and take one of these derivatives and bring it out. And we have, as a result, if you do it carefully, we have real part of h by i. So there was a minus sign in the integration by parts, but bring the i downstairs, cancel that minus sign, and then we have x d of psi star d of x times d of psi d of x plus psi star d psi by dx, okay? So in going from this line to this line, we uh, discarded a boundary term. So there was a term which had the form of, it was d by dx, and inside there was psi star and d psi by dx dx. And because it's a total derivative, we, sorry, let me put this in brackets. This was equal to psi star 
of d psi by dx evaluated at minus infinity to plus infinity, like this. But remember that we are dealing with Bayes functions which have some sort of uh, finite norm. So the Bayes functions, you know, if I integrate it over all space, this is zero. What that means is that psi goes to zero as x goes to plus or minus infinity. So that means that, you know, this thing, this thing goes to zero at the boundary. In fact, we also want this to go to zero at boundary so that it falls off sufficiently fast. Anyway, but this is good enough. So that means this thing is zero, and therefore the boundary term that we got from doing a integration by parts from coming here to here, that, uh, that thing vanishes. All right. So now that we have written this, we can look at this term and you can show that this term is pure imaginary. Because this term is purely imaginary, its real part is zero. On the other hand, you can show that this term is pure real. And therefore, so these are things I'm, I'm leaving as exercises. Uh, so therefore, we conclude that the expectation value of P is given by And if our wave function psi was not normalized, then of course this would be given by this thing. So <clears throat> this is again an example. So momentum is an example of an observable because there is some well-defined way of computing it. But we see that um, instead, you know, when we computed the position, expectation value of the position uh, observable, we had here uh, what was the probability density times the, the observable uh, itself. But here, in when we are computing the expectation value of the momentum observable, we see that there is a differential operator here. So this is a little bit more subtle. So this means that in quantum mechanics, observables are not like just, you know, real numbers as they are in classical mechanics. It means that in quantum mechanics, observables, maybe a differential operators. All right. Let's dig a little bit deeper into this. But before that, you know, let's just uh, talk a little bit about what I mean by observables. So by observables, you know, it could be, for example, the position or momentum of a particle. So observables are anything that can be measured in an experiment. Uh, so position, and then I guess this should be number two, momentum of the particle. Energy is another observable. Now, like in classical mechanics, the total energy of a particle, which is part of a more complicated system, is not a sensible concept. So we have to talk about the total energy of the whole system. For example, we saw that for the Bohr atom, uh, the total energy was quantized. Of course, the Bohr atom consisted, consisted of a proton and an electron. And there could be, for example, you know, uh, angular momentum or um, and it's actually more appropriately called orbital angular momentum. For example, you know, diatomic models or atoms which have some sort of structure they can have some rotation, and those rotations uh, will, will be something that you can measure. 
and uh, that is also an observable. But in quantum mechanics, there are also some new observables which are not there classically. So all these guys, all these observables are there in classical mechanics, but quantum mechanics brings with it its own new observables. So in quantum mechanics, we have observables which are not present in classical mechanics. So uh, a very good example of that is the spin uh, quantum number. Uh, there's also even the amongst the observables that we can see in classical mechanics, in quantum mechanics, they have uh, certain new features. And one of the features is that they can be quantized. So for example, all these things in principle, uh, well, the energy, mostly the energy and the momentum, sorry, the energy and the angular momentum are two um, um, observables which we will see later on are quantized. The other thing that is also very relevant in quantum mechanics is that certain pairs of observables or certain set of observables may be uh, incompatible, meaning that they cannot be measured uh, to arbitrary accuracy simultaneously. That if you measure one very accurately, you cannot measure the other very accurately. And this is where the Heisenberg uncertainty principle will come in. We'll see all of this eventually. So let's now compare uh, the two observe the expectation values. Say x. So this was x psi star psi d of x, and then p is psi star h bar by i d psi by dx, d of x. So we are going to argue that in quantum mechanics, observables become operators. And um, instead of them being uh, like functions or numbers that commute, they become things that in general do not commute. So for example, the position is given in one dimension is given by an operator which is just x so this is just a function and the momentum is given by an operator which is h over i d by dx now this is in one dimension in three dimension this would be given by uh, the position uh, the three coordinates and the momentum operator in three dimensions would be given by h over h, h bar over i times the Laplacian operator. Now, according to the formal definition of expectation value, you know, we should have p given by something like this. So the, the values that the random variable p can take, which is small p, and the probability distribution for that uh, value of the random variable. Now, um, however, we saw, we just derived an expression for the expectation value of p, which was psi star h bar over i, you know, d by dx of psi of dx. Now, we can use the fact that psi of x, and of course this t, but sometimes I'll forget to write the t, uh, is uh, you know, 2 pi h bar, and there's a of p, e i over h bar, px minus e t, d of p. So if I now use this expression for psi in here, then what we get is we get p becomes 1 over square root of 2 pi h bar. There was an integral before, but now there's another integral. So there's a double integral. So we get uh, psi star. And then we have 
a of p and then what we have is this derivative operator now acts on this guy and brings down a factor of i by h that factor of i by h cancels this factor of i h by i so what we have left is just a factor of p so we have a uh, sorry so we have a factor of p and then we have e to the power i by h bar px minus et and then we have dp dx all right so um, however what we know is that the expression for ap implies that um, a star of p is given by square root of 2 pi h bar psi star e to the power i by h bar px minus et d of x and here we have this all the ingredients we have psi star here and this exponential factor we have here and we have the integral over dx so we can rewrite the expectation value of p in terms of a and a star so the expectation value of p can be written as a star of p a of p times p of dp of course this can be rewritten in the form where we have p a of p mod squared of dp so thus we see that the probability density for the momentum distribution is given by a of p uh, mod squared so <coughs> so we have two different expression for the expectation value of p here we have just p uh, multiplying the probability density and that's given by a and a star on the other hand we have another expression for p you know where we have the wave functions but here we have a differential operator so this motivates the following um, uh, observations so the following observation is is something like this suppose we have we look at some physical quantity so physical so sorry mathematical quantity such as the wave function so there is a position representation for it and the position representation the wave function is this guy but there is a momentum representation from this formula we can see that you know um, also is kind of a wave function it has exactly the same amount of information as psi because we can just take the Fourier transform of this to get psi and vice versa so this is also a wave function in its own right so this is a wave function in its own right but it is in a representation that we're going to call the momentum representation and then we have the probability density in the position representation the probability density is psi star psi in the momentum representation the probability density is a star a and then we have the position observable let's call this x hat and in the position representation it's given by x and what is it given by in the momentum representation we'll come to that in a second so the momentum observable which is we call it p hat we just saw that it's given by a differential operator in the position representation like this and in the momentum representation it's just p so, you know, this looks, you know, so the momentum in the momentum representation just looks like P. The position in the position representation just looks like X. 
and you can find out for yourself, I'm not going to do this for you, that the position operator in the momentum representation is given by I h bar d over dp. So in the momentum representation, the expectation value of x is going to be given by a star i h bar d by dp of a times dp and the position the momentum is given by expectation value is given by a star a times p times dp